Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, Real-Time Big Data Analytics in the Cloud 101, Expert Advice from the Attunity and Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 teams. I'm Carol Gunst, and I'll be your MC for today. Uh, if we could just go to the next slide, I'll introduce today's speakers. We've got Jordan Martz, Director of Technology Solutions at Attunity, and Jeff King, Senior Program Manager for Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 at Microsoft. Next slide. Today we'll answer these questions. Why is real-time data important for driving business insights? What's a data lake and why would you use one to store your real-time data? How can you use change data capture or CDC technology to efficiently transfer data to the cloud? How can you build sophisticated analytic workflows quickly? And lastly, why is Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 the best data lake for real-time analytics? This presentation is being recorded and we'll make that uh, the on-demand version available to you shortly after the presentation is finished. Um, We'll also be taking your questions at the end of this um, presentation. So if you could just type them in the question section of uh, go to webinar control panel, um, we'll take those at the end. And now let me turn it over to Jordan Martz of Attunity. Jordan? Thanks, Carol. And thanks everybody for joining us today. I know there's a lot of excitement around not only what Microsoft's doing, but data lakes in general. And what's important is, is the way that we're connecting to these different systems and how we're going to be able to deliver. Think about workloads, not as just the context of my data warehouse, my daily report, that uh, report that comes into my inbox, or I open up my Power BI report and I start to see the analytics as I'm traversing them. What we're gonna talk about today are the different kinds of workloads that you have whether you're reporting directly on the plant floor or whether you're actually just doing your financial reconciliation, there are needs. And there's, there's a huge need as the market sees cloud, right? We've been hearing cloud for a long time, but as the market sees the need to go transfer to the cloud, they're starting to use and, and leverage that data to get it within a couple of minutes so they can make real-time actionable decisions. The power of, of Gen2, I'm going to let Jeff take over and talk about shortly, but I think what's important about the acuity side and what we'll be getting into is the power of ingestion. And what you're going to be able to do is see that information in real time. With Microsoft, there's many different tools that you can use. They'll, we'll talk about those, Cosmos, SQL Data Warehouse, but also all the data really at a core level, it lands into Gen 2 into the core platform of storage. And what Attunity and Microsoft share is this partnership around their Azure platform that's really enterprise-grade ingestion, enterprise-grade, um, one, um, one of the core platforms that you load is, is the Azure platform from a cloud standpoint. But we load many different systems. Operationally, people have built a lot of applications in SQL Server. They've been loaded their previous systems maybe away from their operational SAP or their mainframe, their historical systems. They may have a data warehouse in Teradata or Oracle. You have a lot of these different things, but they all need to lay in one place. As you're building this data lake, that data lake becomes the platform upon which you um, load into your data warehouse on Microsoft. And what you want to be able to have is a continuous ingest strategy. That means that as information is coming out of your operations, your core systems that we've been talking about, those are ready for almost zero downtime. That means that they're in real time coming into you supporting BI and analytics applications. And when you're looking at partners, look for the number one vendor. I mean, selfishly, I work here, so I'm, uh, I'm naturally biased, but I, I do think we, and I know that by numbers, we're definitely number one. So what I wanna do is, is tell you, Look at this partnership as strategic for your business as how you're extracting things and start to think about what I'm gonna do when I migrate this. A lot of different tools in the market um, when you're looking at how to move to Azure. We're gonna start at the life cycle of data migration. What does that mean for you? What that means is we start to look at the database migration assistant, the DMA. And what that looks at is the different ways you're going to assess what I'm gonna move. We start at this circle that's in the middle, this migrating data schema and objects. 
And what we're going to go through is that life cycle. We're going to want to convert potentially. So 2008, you've got all these old legacy SQL servers. Let's move them to a new platform. And you want to be able to look at the applications that are designed. We hear a lot about microservices. We hear a lot about uh, Docker. We hear a lot about these containers as we're building these systems. And what does that mean, not just from an infrastructure, but from the application of building new applications and the tools we have available? We now have data lakes. We've got Spark on top of this that can execute. We've got new languages that we're using beyond just the classics that we used to build where we'd set up a SQL server and we'd use IIS and .NET. We now have on the back end, we've got really scalable architectures that the, that the storage supports. And now you've got the database experience, experimentation assistant that gives you the performance testing that gives you that scalability. And as you're looking to build a dynamic migration, and that you can then later on optimize. There's a lot of other third-party tools we talk about with uh, that we can speak to that will will engage and help you, or at least point with. But when you're moving that core data, look at Azure's database migration service. And as we partner with Microsoft, we're using Azure database migration service and Attunity directly. And what we're doing is we're syncing that data together, and that becomes the foundation of a migration from a point in time. I'm getting rid of a legacy system or a, a competitive database like a Postgres or MySQL. As I move those, I'm able to migrate them to a new platform. And what we're going to do is we're going to be able to cut them over. But what about why we would use a replication and what's important to that replication? So when I talk about those replications, I'm talking about lots of different sources and targets. So my applications at core could be an ERP living on Oracle, or I could have my um, Postgres or MySQL, my, my business runs on hundreds of MySQL systems or Postgres systems. They're either cloud hosted or they're on prem, but I need to sync everything together. So in the relational world, we can run. And a lot of people hear, oh, you have a log inside the database. Well, a lot of databases have logs. So it's important to think about the way that you extract from those systems. And that's just in the operational side of the business. When we talk about real time, we're going to talk about what that operational means. And I'll get to that in my next couple slides. But there's also the data warehouses. You do load, a lot of people load their data warehouses. And as you're loading those, you may have legacy systems in Vertica or Nifteza, Teradata, Oracle Exadata, or you may have Hortonworks called Aramap R, one of these operational reporting, huge systems. Further, you could have mainframes and, and SAP, which I'll get to shortly. But what you wanna be able to do is load them to a lot of different targets. When we talk about the data lake here, at the, at, not at the bottom, it's at the top. It's, one of the first things you're going to load in the Azure world. And when you're loading that, that becomes the impetus to be able to combine all these landing zones of data. I think a lot of you guys have, have probably built data warehouses in the past. And as you think about different data warehouses that you've loaded, you may want to have that single version of that truth all loaded. And that becomes the place where not only are we loading out of it in real time, but we're combining that for this story. And that's going to be important when you're thinking about what am I loading and how am I loading it and where does it all land? Because underneath a lot of the data lakes and a lot of the, the platforms or services is this blob storage. And as you're looking at these blob storage devices and as you're moving to those storage, and not blob storage, but as you're moving to these storage, I'm associating blob because I'm used to being able to put anything in there. And that becomes kind of the fun of it. It becomes the fun of I can load, as I use this quote, 10 billion rows an hour from Exadata using uh, Replicate. That's huge, huge scale. We have systems that have 100,000 tables a second loading because there's so many different databases that are moving. And that gives you a very flexible with all those different environments that we can pull from. So you can load lots of these different systems into um, ADLS. And when you're loading all this, you're able to load uh, gigs and gigs and gigs an hour. It's not just only about setting up a VPN and having that native connection, which is part of the story, which is fundamental to the story. And it helps with the optimization. But it doesn't, it's not a requirement. We talk about replicate. The extraction is powerful because it hooks the source system at the log, and it's able to, at every time a record comes in, it's moving to a new location. That's the extraction. That's the, the full. And whether it needs to be optimized in batches, and that's just how you want to load, that's okay, too. We can, we can handle and support that. But our real value is being able to stream. And while it's in transit, that in-memory stream becomes part of the optimized 
componentry. And as it lands, it, that file transfer and compression is part of the two things I talk about. It's that extraction capability, but also the, the transit capability. And when we've configured, we're optimized for that one. I used to laugh in the Hadoop realm. I used to forget to uh, zip up my files and they'd be way too large. So those little coding mistakes, well, this is alleviated by using replicated, replicate. And by using replicate, what you're able to do is you're, you're just selecting it from a dropdown so you don't forget those things. And even loading into ADLS, when you're putting it into the Azure Data Lake, you're able to, to put it into an optimized format. Maybe it initially lands like a, a rows and columns of a spreadsheet, but it needs to be in a format that's columnar. It'll facilitate you out to those type of sets and being able to build you data lakes that are very, very powerful for uh, being able to read. And then load to new targets, right? The SQL Data Warehouse can then reach into ADLS and pull that data or from your SQL Server environment that you're used to, those tables are able to be selected very comfortably. And that ability gives you a lot of flexibility to deliver a lot of value. And what you're going to be able to do is then you can then move to some of these core platforms using um, our migration utility. You can use a Microsoft migrations. You can move to a lot of these different platforms if, if, if needed. And this is just for the use case of a migration, not for replication. What I'm going to talk to is this core next slide talking about the things to consider when you're replicating. When you're replicating data, what you're looking to be able to do is to be able to generate from any system. In the, in the mainframe, they had like 8-bit and 32-bit and uh, different size files that needed to be converted. Well, that becomes something that we often like forgot how difficult that was because we all are running on x86 machines on the processors and we store a certain way. Now what we're doing is being able to generate structures, schema definitions, database definitions into the data lake. What it also means is the data types that are associated. You want to be able to associate, okay, in Oracle, and I move it to ADLS, I have int 8, I want to have int 12. Things you don't even think about, but it makes it nice to recommend it at least, or give you viable options that are inside there that are available, and it kind of just infers a little bit of, of that complement. It's easily selectable and fixed and changeable if you want to. It also moves, and this is the, the third point with the batch to CDC, taking things that are what used to be, I'm going to run this every hour, I'm going to bring it in, and all the data is coming in within an hour, okay? But what you want to be able to see is the stream. And if that stream of the definitions for those tables change, you want to be able to change with it. In a very structured world, which is on the left side of the screen, you can take that to a unstructured realm and propagate all the changes and those changes over time, which means that you can change the structure of the files and then you can adapt to those files over time. Let's say you, don't want, to remo you want to remove PII data, something personally identifiable that's important. You can filter that out or you can transform it. You can change the new data types or you can use an encryption tool or you can uh, change the date times or fill in values. But these are all in a streaming format that allows you then to be able to load into ADLS in a very powerful way. One of the things we can talk about is, is just a sample architecture for a customer. We got a very large, um, there's a manufacturer we talk about that's uh, streaming all these different systems. And, and what they have are multiple data centers. Heck, you could have, it's lunchtime, so I'll start talking about food, see so everybody's hungry. But like all these SQL servers, Oracles, MySQLs, let's say all their point of sales are, are delivering off those things and you, different, and you order different systems from different locations, you need to ship them to one cloud. It's a great use case for the cloud powerful backend storage of security, all the things you, you need in a, in a powerful different platform. And what you can do is you can then use our replication engine, you can load to an event hub, or you can load directly to ADLS, either way. Heck, in this change data capture, I could draw two lines from that uh, replication engine and draw and skip the event hub and go directly to ADLS. I can do both, or I can load both at the same time. I can split the stream. Lots of different powerful ways to lo load that. And you can manipulate it using uh, data factory to build your data warehouse later. Or you could use Databricks off of the ADLS to then be able to process that data in a, uh, for machine learning and, and enhance the experience. And then off of that, you could use Power BI to render, which there's two points of Power BI. I could draw one arrow from the SQL Data Warehouse to Power BI, and I could also pull from ADLS to Power BI using Spark Chops. So both give me a lot of flexibility to do a lot of different development. And there's a lot of benefit here. There's a lot of benefit that you can now take your data, reprocess it. So there's, there's the aspects of resequencing the data, reprocessing for the sequence, 
and making sure that the order of operations that came in, five, seven, six comes in, you might want to make it five, six, seven. You want to be able to remove some of that optimizations like deletes and those things and process that here. And, and ADLS becomes that landing zone of, of, of enforcement and logic that is very, very powerful. And what we're able to do is we're able to process this in a way that takes different tools like um, blob storage is what we talk about, but like PDFs, right? You're not going to store your PDFs inside of there, your image files, your, uh, your search catalogs. Like think of search engines, right? Let's say you have an internal search application. You could use Blob and, and ADLS to process complex data sets and turn that into something that has semantics or structure and then load it to a data warehouse. But that gives you a lot of flexibility to read and take these like IoT and these big data use cases and drive it from there. And that complements both the structure and unstructure. And what they're doing is they're creating a nice pattern for being able to work with different kinds of data here. And now all these systems, that's on the left, on the bottom left, there's SQL Server or MySQL. A lot of these systems contain a lot of that data. You may have uh, Joe Smith at address X and phone number and, and price also signed the contract, and it's a big old PDF. They'll leave it in in the blob as you create context out of it, and you can take that data and you can then structure a report off of it, and in two different ways, as I noted. When we think about different ways we can complement the different tools, you can use Replicate to load into ADLS, and you can also load into Event Hub, but off of there, you can do ETL. You can lift and shift your underlying Microsoft tools in SQL Server. Let's say your warehouse is built in SSIS. What you may be able to do is you can take that logic that you already have built, convert it to a scalable platform a very enhanced and um, powerful Azure Data Factory and load it with your DBAs. And it, it, both sides give you a very easy to use migration and activity to the cloud. This is a full, I mean, not full proof, but this is a very safe and comfortable way to be able to migrate different technologies in both high speed, but also with something that you can manage and trust. That's key. That's that second bullet to replicate when I talk about not only just being able to automate it, but be able to change with it. There's also all the legacy, right? I could have SQL 2012, 8. I could have 16, 17, all these different systems that need to go to a new one. They're releasing another one coming out, version. And as those versions become something that needs to be maintained, the replicate ecosystem and the tools underneath it allow it just to pick up what version it is and migrate. Let's go further down into the drill detail of this. Let's say I'm using ADL, I'm using Azure Data Factory to migrate to the Azure Data Lake. What I can do is I can automatically pull from these systems in real time, not just pulling at increments, which means I run it every minute, but that real time gives you a story. It gives you a real time reporting story that gives you, okay, I have an operational plant data that needs to be able to have a prediction forecast. I need to be able to take a real-time image and process it in, in deep learning and, and process and, and classify that. And that'll make sure I can categorize errors on the plant floor, something like IIoT. Or maybe I signed a contract, I need to be able to underwrite this individual and look, or fraud detection, all kinds of them. As you're pulling it with Replicate and loading to the Azure Data Lake, it's a near real-time, very, very quick, that you can process this and scalable process, which means you can get your answers when you're going through certain um, algorithms that need to be able to support your business activity. There's no scheduling, it's high performance, and we have all this support from the Replicate side, all these different systems. Your SAP systems are often really um, complex and, mis and difficult to understand, right, if they're not in your native language. And so giving you that SAP extract is something we can do, but we can also combine it with your mainframe, and then let's say you've got a thousand SQL servers on the plant floor, and you've got a bunch of mainframes and a lot of these different uh, operational systems, they all are the unification of why you're bringing this back together. So you have a multifaceted story that you can pull. And what that does is it allows you to take legacy, take current database, enterprise data systems, and your ADW and put it together. That drives this you know, high volume, high transport systems. And as it comes in incrementally, it does it in real time. Well, we're seeing a lot of people right now dealing with a couple of different scenarios. We're dealing with SQL Server 2005 to 2017. I'm dealing with like Sybase and DB2 systems that have some history to them that need to be migrated to new platforms. We can accommodate that activity. 
There's even Teradata and Atiza. I mean, writing the Teradata code sometimes can be difficult. So why learn how to do that? Why not have us help generate that code and we'll work with you on the co and on the covers it generates, but it also makes it very easy or migrate from one cloud to another. And our key thing is supporting the Azure Data Lake Gen 2, which we'll be talking about shortly, Jeff. And that's one of the key things is being able to load not only in streams of data, data analytics and being able to say like, windows of this thing are, are scheduling or real-time applications need to be loaded, that becomes part of the event hub. But also loading Gen 2 becomes key as well as loading on the back end HD Insight will pull off that blob. So lots of different powerful integration points. What I've been talking about are, are not only the source connects but also that intermediate transport. And that's some of the things I talk about a lot. It's the value of the tool. It, it's the number one, it's really easy to work with Attunity, the actual web UI. Number two, it's all those sources. But number three is that middle zone, this transfer. And that means it's using HTTP traffic. So you're not worried all the time about a remote system that's in another cloud or in another operational main uh, or in another um, data center. And I have the permission to connect to it, and I can ship it out across HTTP traffic, and I can get it to you as quickly as possible. We manage the encryption and the compression, and we load to many different targets. And that becomes very, very, very key. And I think that's something people don't think about when they're worrying about cloud movement is all the different security and all the things you have to consider while you do this, which is important. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open this up to, to Jeff and, and convert to the next set. And what we're gonna talk about is the power of the data lake storage right here. Uh, hi, thanks, thanks Jordan. And, and do I have control now? Let me give you keyboard right there. Okay, you can click. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as as Carol and Jordan said, my name is Jeff King, and I work on the Azure Data Lake Storage uh, Gen 2 engineering team. Uh, a little bit about me. I've been at Microsoft for a little more than 10 years. Uh, I initially joined uh, Microsoft as a, as a Microsoft consultant and have worked on various primarily customer and partner facing teams to, uh, to effectively drive and uh, solutions built on uh, various Microsoft software, <laughs> Biz, ranging from BizTalk to uh, Azure <laughs> and everything in between. So uh, it's, it's really great to, uh, to have the opportunity to, to, to talk to you guys, uh, to talk to all of you. So let's, let's go ahead and, and dive in. And Jordan or Carol, please uh, instruct me how, how I change. Okay, all right. Ah, okay. So let's first talk about a uh, data lake, uh, just as a, as a concept. Uh, it was originally coined by James Dixon, uh, CTO of Pinto, uh, around 2011. And he issued this when he was uh, issuing a problem statement of, of big data primarily how he thinks we should be tackling it versus how we were tackling it at the time. Uh, in fact, he wanted to contrast what he was seeing in the industry, particularly between the business needs left unmet uh, compared with the generally accepted IT solutions and architectures. Uh, and before the notion of a data lake existed, you know, various IT and business groups within the same organization would seemingly compete with one another to build a system which would capture and retain more data than the other groups. Uh, it was almost an arms race, if you could think about it, right? Data became sexy because it, was, because it gave us power. Data hoarding and ultimately data silos became an unintended consequence. Uh, once we built our kingdom, anyone who wanted to enter it needed our blessing. Uh, we could and oftentimes would deny access to other groups more often than not. I mean, I don't want to invest in sharing with you and supporting you was a common response to, to such requests. Right? And at the time, big ma massive data marts and data warehouses were being built on top of Hadoop clusters, distributed computation models, uh, as well as large column-based solutions. Uh, these guys could answer anything you threw at it, right? provided it owned the data, or at least controlled access to it, they could aggregate and collate to the cows came home. Again, provided you already knew what you wanted, the data, how it was stored, 
So you knew the schema it was stored as and how clean and reliable it was, i.e. you had some ETL jobs to cook and scrub and clean, dedupe and, and dedupe and even catalog the data, right? The problem is that in the world of big data, we don't really know what value the data has when it's initially accepted from the various and sundry sources available to us. I mean, some of us, probably, probably all of us could relate to, to the notion of, yeah, just go ahead and get the data. We don't know what we're going to do with it yet, but once we figure that out, it'll be there when we have it, right? And so you saw this just massive uh, just demand across the industry for just more data, more stores, more, 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 right? And some, you can often argue, and you would have a very compelling argument that uh, this massive, uh, uh, the need to store a massive amount of data doesn't, uh, uh, was actually one of the reasons why we have cloud. The problem is that, you know, even though we might know some questions we want to answer, but we don't know to the extent uh, that makes sense to us, and it closes off the ability to answer questions that materialize later, right? Uh, therefore, storing data in some preconceived notion of, of what we see as optimal at that time may not be optimal for later analysis and therefore doesn't make sense. In short, we don't know what we don't know. So let me talk about what makes a great data lake then, right? Uh, we need to store the data in a massively easily accessible repository and it, and it needs to be based on cheap storage that's available today right then when there are questions that need answering that is the time to organize and sift through the chunks of data that will provide those answers right so at the very first a data lake is massive it grows when your data needs to grow right as you need to stage cultivate schematize cook consume report on aggregate with including projects, replicate, catalog, govern, secure, encrypt, erase your code, protect, publish, authorize access to, and ultimately archive to cheaper medium because you are going to have ginormous, god-awful amounts of data. Simply put, your stakeholders are going to start, if they haven't already, demanding more and more, and you need to be able to store all that more. Right? And it also needs to be secure, right? Because you're going to stage, cultivate, schematize, cook, consume, report on, I won't repeat, I won't <laughs> repeat all of the verbs, uh, and ultimately archive to a cheaper medium, your data lake will need to ensure the integrity and safekeeping of your data. And as you can all imagine, you know, we've all seen it and it seems to be happening almost every other week. Uh, some news headline shows that the next Experian uh, has just, oh, by the way, your data, your personal data has been our been out and being sold across the globe from hackers for the last six months but we didn't we didn't tell you right so you need to you need to be able to you're going to need a security a security platform that accepts and leverages a common data model uh, and today oauth is a de facto choice for that right because it, it the the world is going more and more more uh, mobile right and we got to target those mobile systems and and the more the cloud the, the world is also going more to to a cloud host and as well. So it needs that flexibility and OAuth provides that. In fact, ADLS Gen 2 relies on AAD uh, to, to provide that security model uh, across the board. And, and, and since OAuth is an industry standard, there are a lot of ancillary SDKs and extensions and plugins that, that integrate with AAD and support OAuth. Right? In fact, you could take uh, Hadoop, Storm, Spark, IoT devices, clickstream, mainframes, on-prem, all of that stuff, you know, will will integrate with AAD, right? Uh, and in today's world, your organization is heavily judged, right, and evaluated by your company's ability to maximize its performance through data-driven innovation. So it makes sense that you need to make sure your data isn't stolen or hacked or disregarded, mismanaged, corrupted, and so on. Bottom line, a good data lake gives you the flexibility and capabilities required to ensure all of this, right? Uh, and of course, it needs to perform, right? You, when you're asked to explain to your CEO why he's not able to get his questions answered because the system is resource star, star, he or she isn't going to accept, I'm sorry, I can't support the business right now, right? A data lake, when you have a good data lake, a good data lake design, you should not be running into that problem, 
right? Uh, you need to be able to ensure that you are able to provide the same or better level of end user uh, performance or the perception of it, right? At all times. Uh, and next, a, uh, a good data lake should easily support onboarding another upstream data source or even a downstream consumer, right? The next, um, the next IoT device, the next uh, set of web servers, or the next Power BI dashboard, or uh, publishing this data externally, whatever the case may be, you need to be able to integrate with that very easily and seamlessly, right? It needs to, it needs to allow any system to place its data in the lake without enforcing a format or a schema, right? Because both change. And big data systems understood and accepted this inevitable fact, right? And in fact, it was the impetus for their creation, right? This is why big data systems em embrace the schema on read notion, right? Where uh, we're not going to enforce a schema when you push the data into our system, right? When you upload that data into our system, right? We're going to pay, we're going to pay the piper when we're actually going to consume that data, right? And then that's when we're going to uh, mold that data into a schema of which the uh, system can understand and, and, and process, right? And of course, lastly, uh, this shouldn't come to any surprise to anyone. We need to do it cheaply, right? That, that's, that's always the top tenant for any, uh, any IT organization's effectiveness, right? Lowering total cost of ownership will always, will always be one of those key metrics there, right? And as you continue, and as you continue to accumulate these ginormous hordes of data, you're going to need to put some processes around it, right? You need to tame the wild west, as it were. So your data lake will need to support a flexible data lifecycle management and data governance policies, which will undoubtedly be tailored to the data sensitivity, value, exhaust rate, and uh, et cetera, right? So let me give you an example by what I mean by this, right? Uh, next slide. Thank you. Okay. So the data lake metaphor is a great one, right? When you think about, when you mentally picture an actual lake full of water, right? That water is all natural, right? Which means that you can take the, which means you have to take the good with the bad. Uh, if you want to consume this water, you need to figure out how to tap into it. And that may present some early challenges, but the payoff is huge. And depending on a bunch of environmental factors you might be drinking, you might be safe drinking that water raw without boiling it or putting any iodine tablets in it and so on. And if you're actually in high enough altitude, you're probably safe because it's glacial melt, right? And you don't have to worry about contamination, right? You might be safe doing all that. But, and, and, and so data in a data lake is much the same. You know, without a good understanding of the data it stores, you will need to take the good with the bad. And, and you're not, and without really knowing how to distinguish between the two when you're consuming it. And if you care enough, you'll build something to address uh, that later on so you're able to separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were, right? In fact, you could probably think of a data mart or a data warehouse as kind of like the bottled water, right? Because it's been processed and packaged for easy consumption, right? Plus, you know what you're getting when you buy the bottle, right? There's no surprises there, right? Unless there's another news headline to tell you otherwise, but that's a whole another story and probably another webinar, right? So what you see here is a, is a, is a pie chart to just simply, I'm just trying to paint a simple picture for you, right? Uh, of how a data lake might be organized uh, or how you might consider organizing it, right? Uh, so here we have four logical buckets and I'll go through them. So the first bucket we'll talk about is sort of the landing bucket or the staging bucket, right? That, that's where your raw data is, um, comes, comes into, right? This is where your upstream data sources dump their raw data, right? There's minimal data governments here. Uh, there's likely um, little uh, security enforcement Obviously, they're going to be, there's, there's going to be exceptions to that, but you understand the idea, the notion, right? Then, uh, after we land the data in the data lake, there's going to be cooking, right? We need to cook the data. We need to, we need to put this data in, in such a way, in such a format, maybe even, right? Uh, especially when we know what the downstream consumers are, right? But nonetheless, ultimately, we need to bless this data, right? We need to say that it's been cleaned and possibly combined and collated with other data sources, 
that it's been enriched to an appropriate level. Uh, and also that it's, there's probably been some notion of tagging and cataloging, uh, some creation of new metadata over that data such that uh, other teams can know what uh, that, and in fact, if they need that data, that they know where to get it and, and what's, the, uh, what's the state of that data, right? And well, continuing on, right? You would say that team, <clears throat> that very same team that needs that blessed data, they're gonna, they got a project, right? So they're gonna, we need to carve out a sort of a work area for all of the team, different teams within your organization, right? So they will have another little area, call that the work area, scratch area, what have you. And this is a, this is essentially the proverbial drawing board for all of your organization's teams when they have projects. And you know they they need a place to manipulate the data without any impact to other stakeholders. Uh, but it's also important to call out the fact that at this point there's no PII data in this in this bucket, right? There should all sensitive data uh, has been scrubbed, right? Uh, there's no possibility of exposure, and if the data is exposed, it's it provides a little value. Right. You don't really you shouldn't really need PII data um, unless, again, of the exceptions in order to just get your project off the ground and, you know, functionality and whatnot. Right. And last and not least, you have your super sensitive data bucket. Right. This is where your PII data, your company's secret sauce, you know, IP, that's where all that's stored. Right. And it's going to should be encrypted at rest. Right? There's a high amount of, of governments uh, and security uh, applied here, as you can uh, uh, naturally understand. You know, it's very restricted access, right? And usually uh, you would only want to temporarily grant, grant that access to, um, to individuals requiring it, right? Only, only a handful of people would actually have access to that. Uh, okay, so let's just talk about Azure Data Lake Gen 2. So I've given you and I, you know, we covered some of the general notions and understanding of the problems of uh, that a data lake attempts to, to address and, and presumably solve, right? And, but there's also, just like any other technical solution, it has its own set of, of challenges that we're going to face when rolling one out in our own organization, right? I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's a new concept to a lot of organizations and therefore you have to, you have to, be patient with that organization to, and, and, and understanding what their needs are and making sure that you meet those needs and building a data lake uh, that, that meets those needs, but all, at the same time is, is, is not over, overwhelming or overbearing, right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, since, uh, you know, the kind of <laughs> just like Jordan, I, I have a little bit of a bias too, as I said, a word from Microsoft. So I'm going to talk about data lake. Gen, storage Gen 2. Uh, so, as I said, Gen 2 is built with all those previous tenants that I mentioned, right? The security, scalability, performance, and so on, right? But speaking specifically about security, it, it, it actually has a granular security model, right? Gen 2 has, uh, you're able to control the security and access on the, on the very fine grain of the object itself, right? And as I said before, it integrates with Azure Active Directory, uh, which then can also integrate with your uh, on-prem Active Directory or LDAP um, uh, source, right? And, and you'll be covered from a security standpoint, right? And it also provides you with a rich set of object tiering and replication op options. You can leverage Azure Data Catalog, for example, to retain a rich set of metadata across your landscape. Uh, for example, you can set retention policies to dictate the automatic tiering of your data as it cools, right? You, there's, a, there's a cost savings uh, benefit to that, right? Uh, it'll also scale and perform to your needs, right? It, Gen2 provides a truly no limits experience, right? And with over 50 regions, I think we have, what, 54 now, uh, we, we have more regions than any other cloud provider, period. No other cloud provider has more regions than we do. And that way, if you, if you want that global footprint, Gen2 can provide that global footprint to you. If, you. if you're a global organization or your audience is global, your, your data can be spread across and you can even use Attunity Replicate to, to, to push that data across all of your different uh, 
physical data lakes, for example, that are, could be spread across multiple regions, right? Uh, and last, of course, it is, it is con cost effective, right? We, you, we're offering Gen 2 at commodity level prices, right? If you're using, and if you're using Azure Data Lake Store Gen 1 today, I encourage you to switch over to Gen 2 simply because of the fact that your bill will be cut roughly in half. Okay? So let me talk a little bit about the integration readiness and the, you know, and the, the multimodal access. This is actually a very interesting thing. So during our, in our journey to create Gen 2, we wanted to uh, build and, and ensure that, again, we're not incidentally creating uh, another data silo that is data lake, right? We, we wanted to make sure that there was easy integration with, uh, with big data systems and outside of big data systems, right? If you're, if you're not in Hadoop, right, or if you're not in SQL Data Warehouse, you don't know, you probably don't even really care what a file or folder is, right? You, you're in cloud. You want that, that scalable object storage uh, model, right? And so we wanted to support that model, right? So Gen2 provides two ways of access. You have the object store, right? That you get, that you will see with the, that you've probably seen with blob storage or uh, other, other object storage like uh, S3 or uh, Google, <clears throat> Google Drive or what have you. You know, those are, those are object storage mechanisms, right? And, you know, they, it's as simple, simple as your URL to that, to that object effectively defines your hierarchy. It's an implied arc, uh, hierarchy. It's not an actual hierarchy, right? Uh, but in Gen 2, we actually, we wanted to embrace that object store model, but we also wanted to introduce a, a file system model that is uh, more natural for a big data system. Right. So now you will actually be able to access the same data, the same underlying data through multiple ways. Right. Uh, Jordan. Yeah. So let's kind of talk about the architecture a little bit. Right. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, you, you were there are a bunch of horizontal and cross cutting uh, control plane mechanisms. We're inheriting those from blob storage. So one of the things that you should understand about Gen 2 is uh, conceptually, and as this sort of as this diagram kind of you know illustrates, it kind of looks like Gen 2 is built on top of Blob Storage. And I guess from a conceptual and discussion standpoint, you could we'll go with that. But in reality, it's actually um, it, it's on top, but it's also a little bit beside, right? So as I said in the uh, previously, the Gen 2 provides the the two different models or modes of accessing the data, right? You've got your Blob API that we get from Blob Storage. It's been around for 10 and a half, 11 years or what have you. And then we have this new Gen 2 API that uh, allows you to access that same data in a, in a hierarchical manner, right? So the notions of files and folders, uh, if, if that's what you need, right? Especially if you're in a Hadoop or a, an HDFS compliant system, that's, that's the API you'll be hitting in order to access that, right? Uh, so we have this notion of a hierarchical file system, as I was saying, right? Gen 2, this is new, this came from Gen 2, or this is coming with Gen 2. And, and so if you enable this, right, it's as simple as enabling this on an Azure storage account. So what is, let me just kind of pause for a second and, 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 and get down to brass tacks. What is in reality, right, an Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 account, you say, hey, I want to I want to create one of these. I want to try this out now. Well, actually, to, in order to try this out, you need to get whitelisted, and we can talk about that later. And I'm happy to do that if you if you're not already whitelisted, uh, you need to let's talk, right? But uh, you go essentially after your whitelist, you go to the portal, right? Say, hey, I want to create a new storage account, right? And and I want this to be uh, Gen two enabled, right? It's just through a few clicks of the button, you're you're off to the races, right? and you can enable uh, namespace after that fact. And once you enable namespace, right, once you enable that hierarchical uh, file system, which is the same as a namespace, you now have your multimodal access, right? You now have the interoperability. That's, that's the idea here. You'll be able to get the same amount 
of security uh, and the same level of, of perf and scale and at, the, and, and, and at the same commodity price, right? That's the idea of Gen 2. Okay, so let's actually go into uh, some, some actual uh, uh, workloads. So <clears throat> let's start talking about data warehouse, right? We'll, we've, gotta, we've gotta give homage to data warehouse. It's been around and it'll continue to be around because it's a very uh, applicable uh, model, right? And, and so here we have uh, a bunch of upstream ingestion points of various formats, uh, uh, formats, sizes, encodings, uh, schemas, so on and so on, right? Uh, you, you're familiar with this notion. You got to be able to integrate with all of them. You got to be able to extract that data, probably some ETL jobs. Well, you're going to be looking at uh, doing, uh, doing this through, for example, an, an ADF. You could leverage Azure Data Factory uh, for for orchestrating these these uh, this e these ETL processes, right? And and ultimately the land the data will will land into uh, into your uh, Gen2 account. Well, uh, really, what's happening and what you're not really seeing in this diagram, the data probably would have already landed in the Gen2 account somehow, and maybe it was running through ADF, and then maybe there's a, a later um orchestration uh not yet jordan please go back um <clears throat> the the uh, uh you have another um uh, e set of etl processes that uh, allow the cooking and manipulation of this data you could be running and you can even run those in you know an azure databricks cluster or even uh, you know an hd insight cluster uh to to be able to handle that at scale right and ultimately, you're going to need to apply some schema to it, right? Because as I said, this is, this is a modern data warehouse workload. So you, you need to know what that schema looks like in order for the data to uh, be properly accepted by the data warehouse. Uh, so this, this, in this model, you can kind of think of this as an, uh, using data, Gen2 facilitating the use of, of a sort of discrete analytics over known over a known square uh, schema and known and known queries right and power bi being sort of at the front end uh consuming this data uh whether that's directly through data warehouse or through a middle tier of like azure analysis service you know through a, through a large cube for example uh and those you know this is effectively going to provide somewhat of an interactive uh, experience right okay jordan go ahead so then uh let's talk about uh and in advanced analytics. So in advanced analytics uh, workload, uh, you know, you'll see there's a lot of the same objects here, there's a lot of the same shapes. So I won't worry about the left side. You get the idea. Data's coming in, it needs to land, and and we need to we need to cook it and so on. And you know, and, and really this is kind of built for for um, you know machine learning in mind, right? You can think of it as um, you know your data scientists needing to answer a few poignant questions and they need a heck of a lot of data in order to do it, right? And <clears throat> so you're still gonna have those upstream data sources like I mentioned, uh, and the data scientist might even need to create a new ancillary set of jobs to run um, and, and orchestrate, maybe through ADF, maybe through, uh, through other means, and just to get that data ready for, for them to consume uh, appropriately. And then, uh, they're going to probably they might consume that data through uh, Azure Databricks again, uh, using one of its out of box machine learning libraries or a third party library that it supports. Right. So Databricks, uh, Spark ML, as a matter, Spark ML specifically has uh, a very rich set of of uh, capabilities, and uh, they're constantly adding more and more features uh, to to that. Right. And you know, and to the right side, you know, after after the Databricks side, like ultimately, you may end up need to land this data in something like in a in a Cosmos uh, database, whether that's for you know for other uh, applications to consume. Uh, once the data scientist has sort of figured out everything and and figured out how to ask the questions and and in which data in which it needs to ask those questions over, uh, once it's sorted all that out, ultimately the data will will probably land in a, in a way that we've already seen uh, before. Uh, so next, <clears throat> let's talk about real-time analytics. Uh, so 
let's pause for a second and ask ourselves why why would we want to burden ourselves with implementing an analytical solution in real time mode right i mean predictive and ad hoc batch analysis solutions that we've been building to date they present enough challenges right well the hard truth is that where the business is forcing the industry to go we are compelled to churn through so much data that it's impossible to wait till off peak hours to cook the raw data if we wait then we won't get it through before the next business day then to make to make matters really interesting iot entered the room and really turned things on i mean overnight our data lakes needed to support huge ingestion type right some organizations are now seeing petabyte levels of raw data uh, due to the millions of devices uh, pushing their per minute or sub minute telemetry data points into their lakes. Uh, and frankly, only a cloud-based data lake can support this amount of load uh, consistently and predictably. So let's dig into this architecture right quick. Uh, a typical real-time system embraces the messaging architecture because it scales. It scales at a obscene level. Uh, IoT and other upstream devices will probably package their data into small manageable bits and then they'll push it into that scalable messaging system like uh, HDI Kafka or Azure IoT Hub or something like that. And if you're not familiar with Kafka, uh, I encourage you to go check it out. Apache Kafka uh, supported uh, pervasively and, and it, it, it works really well. And I encourage you to go check out IoT Hub if you haven't already. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, you might need to marry this device telemetry with other existable data stores like we talked about earlier you see on the left and luckily you have adf for that uh similar prepping and cooking and so on and then what what may what may slightly change is that now since again this is real time you got to get rid of that batch you need to replace that batch mode of processing to a more streaming or micro batch uh mechanism right you can use azure stream analytics you can also use azure databricks and just leverage the spark spark streaming model in fact, the great thing about Spark is that you can take those previously uh, Spark batch query type things that you may have had um, in the previous iteration. Now you need to turn those same queries into a real time and streaming based. It's Spark allows that it's through, a, through, through one or two lines of code, you can turn a batch to a stream, it's awesome. Uh, and then you know later on schematize and data and so on and so on and so on on, on, the, uh, on the right side. So, what you what I just wanted to highlight here is that Gen 2 is really can really meet a variety of, of, of different workloads, <clears throat> even workloads that we haven't covered here. Uh, and I know we're kind of running short on time. So Jordan, if you want to go ahead and click through these last couple of slides, uh, we'll spend about five seconds on each one. Just kind of wanted to highlight some of the partners and customers alike across the different industry verticals. As you can see, we're all over the place. Many, many, many endorsements across many industries and a lot of household names, <clears throat> as well as uh, the partner ecosystem. So what you, you see here, we've got a lot of partners. You see Attunity there as well. There are many other partners. We also have um, a lot of big data partners. A lot, all the distribution, the, the Hadoop distro event vendors are going are working to support Gen2 today. Databricks and HDI already do support Gen2. Hortonworks, Cloudera, and MapR have already committed to supporting Gen2, and their engineering teams are working on it now. So, uh, I want to leave some time for, for, for questions, so I'm just going to cut myself off. Uh, thank you for your time, and, and Carol and Jordan, back to you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, Jordan's got a slide up here on Attunity Replicate from Microsoft Migrations. This is a free download for people who want to uh, give uh, this product a try. Uh, you can uh, migrate data to the Microsoft data platform by simply going to attunity.com backslash Microsoft migrations. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, Jeff, let me just start with one for you. When will um, ADLS Gen 2 be ready? Ah, uh, good question. So uh, we are we're targeting to the end of end of this year. Uh, that's that's our plan GA date. If, if you're interested, I encourage you to try it out now. Uh, we're in public, we're in a limited public preview now, and, and uh, we are actively um, uh, working with customers and partners to get, uh, to get feedback that we're, uh, that we're taking action on and, and iterating on before we GA. So if you haven't checked it out, please do so now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, we had another question um, more specific to Attunity Replicate. 
Um, can you replicate data in a reverse direction? In a reverse direction, um, yeah, you can. Or I mean, you can sync it, which would be a reverse direction. Um, you can send it from one target right back immediately. You could be listening to the back. Um, I think it's an individual use case. So one of the things to do is to reach out and contact us if you those type of questions. Like we can delve deeper into it. Okay, another question, uh, Jordan. Uh, can you move data using a Tunity replicate um, with no downtime um yes but there's always slas right there's always you could lose network connectivity there's always problems that could arise so we we always mark that as, as long as everything's working in an optimal manner yeah there's zero downtime i mean it's near real time as your network latency is basically what i say Okay, and last one this might be a little off topic, so um, you let me know. Uh, Jordan, can you describe different use cases for using a tool like Attunity with Kafka? Um, well, Kafka can get ingested into, it has to be, it, it's not meant to be a storage platform. It's meant to be collecting a lot of data. So what you can do by collecting that Kafka is you can then store it in a platform like ADLS for heavy duty processing. There's a lot of conversations around like joining data and those type of things, Kafka streams versus Spark streaming. And what you have is the ability to store it in one platform and process it in an optimal manner. And ADLS is one of the best best in the world at being able to process that type of content. So um, Jeff, do you have any thoughts on Kafka and ADLS working together? Uh, yeah, it, oh, yeah, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not muted. Okay, so yeah, it, it, it works. Um, so, well, actually, so Kafka, actually, let me back up. Um, the notion of Kafka is, so you can, you can jump, you can dump data into Kafka, or Kafka can dump data into Gen 2 after it's been processed or what have you, right? It can, it can use uh, Gen 2 as, as a sink. Um, most likely, just given the nature of how Kafka works, the data will, will probably reside on, say, a persistent uh, uh, VM disk attached to the, uh, to the running VM. That's usually how uh, Kafka deployments are structured. Okay, and last question, Jim. Uh, anything you want to add on the differences between ADLS Gen 2 and ADLS Gen 1? Uh, sure. Um, a top of mind, you you effectively you get you get more regions. So instead of Gen, so Gen 1 today is in is in four regions. Uh, Gen 2 will be in, in all regions, which I said, I think is over 50. I think we have 54 regions today. Uh, third thing is that you get a rich set of, of data lifecycle management and, and um, uh, replication uh, abilities, right? You can choose what type of replication level you want, whether that's local redundant, geo redundant, zone redundant, and so on. Uh, and, and soon you will actually, we're, we're going to make available to you uh, the ability to choose which region you want to replicate to, as well as which region or when you want to uh, fail over to your secondary region. Uh, and, and, uh, and all of this, and, and lastly, the big, biggest difference is that it's, it's half the cost, right? It, you're, you're really, you're going to be able to get more and, and you're going to be able to get it for less. It's truly like, a, like an infomercial. Wait, there's more, wait, there's more, wait, there's more, and you're going to get it for less. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jordan and Jeff. We're at the top of the hour, so I think we're going to wrap up this webinar today. Um, as I mentioned to everybody at the top of the hour, this is being recorded, and we'll have information out to you shortly um, about how to uh, get your version of the on-demand webinar. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.